Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. The repository pattern can be pretty polarizing. Some developers view it as unnecessary, especially when using an RRM, while others find the value in it for encapsulating data access logic and testing. I'll explain where I find it useful and where I don't based on the architecture that I often use. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So we have a common understanding of what the repository pattern is. I'm using Martin Fowler's from Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture in that the repository pattern mediates between the domain and the data mapping layer using a collection-like interface for accessing domain objects. Key part there, domain objects, not data models, not data, domain objects. So oftentimes I'm using CQRS to separate out the kind of the paths for reads and writes from a caller. This isn't a top level architecture, but just a decision you can make in certain places that you kind of divide the concerns of kind of the write path for commands and the read path for queries. I've created a video on kind of the myths about CQRS. I've done a bunch of videos on it. It's probably not as complicated as you think it is. Again, this diagram illustrates it. It can be kind of done at a service later. So where you have a caller, if it needs to perform some state change, do something a part of um, your system, it goes to the command side. If it needs to read data for UI, for reporting, whatever the case may be, that's going to the query side. You could still be using the same schema, the same database. You don't need to be using multiple databases. It's just about setting the read path and the write path in kind of different directions. To visualize what that actually looks like in code is if you have a customer service, which has kind of a mixture of commands and queries. So we have some methods that are performing state changes and doing type some type of mutation with our data in our database. And then some other methods here are just simply returning state, like the get customer with name. What that looks like is just simply splitting this up into two different services, one for writes, one for reads. So we have one service here that specifically just is doing state changes, commands, and the read service, which is just returning data and not doing any state changes. I often think that most people that are implementing CQRS ultimately end up in this way because CQRS is really a gateway and opens up a lot of different options to do different things. One of those things is organizing code and focusing on features rather than technical concerns. And what this leads to is more of a vertical slice architecture where you have a command or a set of commands and queries that ultimately represent a feature. But it could just be an individual command is a feature. So what that looks like is you have here, I have two different features, two different queries. If I were using a repository and returning different domain objects and then using um, that database like I have here listed, what that really starts turning into is you realize that you don't need the domain objects, you just want the data. And because you have these two different separate paths for commands and queries, it allows you to do that. So what that means is on the command side for those features, you use a repository to get out an aggregate. But on the query side, you don't need the aggregate. You simply want to get the data that you need from a particular data model, however you do that. And again, they could be using the same database. So one reason why you don't need the actual aggregate in your queries is because an aggregate is a consistency boundary. And if your queries aren't performing any state changes, then you don't need the aggregate. There's no state changes that you're performing. You don't need the consistency boundary. So instead of using the repository and getting out an aggregate, which is going to take all the actual domain objects in that aggregate, you may not need all of it. Rather, what you would preferably do is just go to the underlying source where the data is and query specifically the, the data that you need rather than grabbing out that entire um, aggregate when you don't really aren't making state changes at all. You just want to get specific data. So let's jump into some code so I can show some examples. All the code I'm showing is available to my developer level members on YouTube and Patreon. You'll get access to the source code if you want to support my channel, as well as a new Discord server with a private channel just for members. So like many of my other videos, I'm using the eShop on web sample application, and I'm specifically looking at a get my orders handler, which is basically a page. Um, this is a particular mediator query for getting out the list of all the orders for a particular user. So what it's doing here is it's using the specification pattern and then passing that specification to a repository say to get out all the orders, which are an aggregate. Then it's using that aggregate or that collection of all those aggregates to then build up an order view model that's then passed to a razor view. 
So in this particular example, again, we're overfetching data. We don't need the aggregate because there's a bunch of data here that we actually don't even care about that aren't even used in the view. So to kind of refactor this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove, this, remove the specification, remove the repository, and then go directly to the data source using Entity Framework, which behind the scenes, this order repository is ultimately doing. So here's the refactored version, which is no longer using the repository. Instead, we're just injecting the DB context from Entity Framework. And we're going directly to the orders um, DB set. I'm in doing the where in the includes, which is ultimately what the specification was doing. And now instead of selecting everything, I'm just selecting the data that I actually need. So I'm getting the sum of the units and the price from the actual line items that I've included here, and then the order date and the order number. In the other version, we are including all the line items, the product for each individual line item, the shipping address, all that data we didn't actually need for the view. So instead, I'm just selecting the data that we actually need. So again, remove the repository, remove the specification, and go directly to the data source. I don't need a consistency boundary, I just need data. So one of the benefits of the specification that I removed is it added a central place that I could encapsulate the filtering and eager loading uh, that I need to perform, especially if I needed to do it in more than one place. That doesn't mean that you necessarily need to stop doing that. And to kind of alleviate that, all I've done is create an extension method that has that same type of logic in it. So what we can do now is I can create this extension method on our DB context and do the, uh, the filter, the where, the include, return that queryable so that what I can do here is remove all this logic and then simply do orders with customers and then send back in our username. So instead of having a class, we can have an extension method. It's doing the same thing. It's giving it a name. It's encapsulating that logic. You're still returning an iQueryable just like you were before. So this is a way to get around if you need to have that kind of filtering or eager loading in more than one place and you're concerned to having to write that everywhere, just created something like an extension method. And very similar to a bunch of the repository tests that were here, I can still test that extension method. I'm using the in-memory database or you can use the SQLite uh, in-memory database. And I'm just setting up basically two orders. I'm saving them in our context. And then I'm fetching one out using that extension method and just asserting that I'm only getting that one particular order with the actual order items. So it's still all very testable. So on the command side for making state changes, there's this basket service that kind of fits the bill already. There's various methods for making state changes. One of them is add item to basket. It's using a specification for the same idea just to get out that particular um, ID, doing all the includes that are required. It's getting out the actual aggregate, which is our basket, and then we're calling add item. And again, consistency boundary here. Because we have the actual order itself or the basket and all the line items within it, one of kind of the logic that we have here is that if you're adding an item that is already in your basket, we don't want to add a new line item. Instead, we just want to increment the quantity um, that you're trying to order of the existing item that's already in your basket. And we can do that within our aggregate here of our basket. You can see that it's this base entity that implements I aggregate root. And again, it's our consistency boundary. We're making state changes. So again, here, it makes sense to be using a repository that, that can build up that what that aggregate is, make sure that's filtering out what it needs to, that it's an eager loading because entity frameworks behind the scenes and we want eager load. We want to get everything out as one. And then we can just deal with our aggregate uh, from our basket service. So as you can see, if I've ever posted in other videos about the repository and what I feel about it or on Twitter, is that it depends. And it's not one or the other, but it's where I'm using it. If I'm applying CQRS and vertical slices, that means on the command side, I generally am using a repository because I want to get back an aggregate. And an aggregate is a consistency boundary. Because of that, on the query side, I don't need the aggregate generally. So I can go use some other mechanism to get the underlying data that I need, wherever that's at, and just get that data. I don't need the aggregate. I don't need a consistency boundary. One caveat to this on the query side is whatever data access you're using, if it is not testable, then yes, I understand abstracting it. However, if you are using something testable, like I was illustrating with EF Core, it's just a matter of doing setup data, whether you're using an in-memory provider or the SQLite in-memory or a real provider. It's just a matter of doing setup data and it is testable. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up 
If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.